Our next presenter is Jeff Von Wang from the Schmal Science Workshop, San Jose, California. Hello everyone, my name is Jacqueline Wang and I'm here to present to you a novel method to determine human blood typing through molecular genetic analysis. So today, I'm going to talk about the problems surrounding blood transfusion, the current method of serology, the new method of molecular testing, and the results of my experiment. So first of all, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Well, according to the Public Health Agency of Canada, one in 5,000 transfusions result in an immune reaction to the donated blood. An immune reaction occurs when there is a mismatch between donor and recipient blood types. The recipient's immune system attacks and destroys the blood cells in the donated blood. This condition can be potentially life-threatening, especially for patients who undergo multiple blood transfusions, such as those suffering from leukemia or sickle cell anemia. Another problem is the hemolytic disease of the newborn. This disease occurs when an Rh-negative mother is carrying an Rh-positive child. The antibodies in the mother's bloodstream can attack the antigens on the surface of the baby's red blood cells. Because current serological methods cannot detect parental zygosity, 40% of pregnant women are unnecessarily treated for HDN to curb antibody production. This may cause unwanted side effects. So now I've talked a little about the problems with blood transfusions, I'm going to get into a little background on blood type. Let's take, for example, that someone is type A blood type. This means that they have an A antigen on the surface of the red blood cell and anti-B antibodies in their bloodstream. If they're type B, they have B antigens on the surface of their red blood cells and anti-A antibodies in their bloodstream. If they're type AB, they have both A and B antigens on the surface of their erythrocytes and not, um, neither anti-A or anti-B antibodies in the bloodstream. If they're type O, they don't have B or A antigens on the surface of, of their red blood cells, and they have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies in their bloodstream. So as I've mentioned before, an immune response happens when there's a mismatch between donor-recipient blood type. So let's take, for example, a person with type A blood type receives type B blood type. The anti-B antibodies in the recipient's blood will attack the B antigens on the surface of the donated blood. So now that we've talked a little about the A and B antigens, I'm going to get to the D antigen. The D antigen, also known as the Rh factor, controls the plus or minus the human blood type. As you can see here, here are the D antigens on the surface of the red blood cells, and then the epitopes, which connects the antigens to the antibody in order to produce an immune reaction. One problem with this it's because the presence of the D antigen um, marks the plus you see in the blood type, and the absence of the D antigen marks the minus you see in blood type, serological tests may detect a weak D or a partial D as positive of negative instead of positive. This is because with a weak D, there are a less amount of antigens on the red blood cell than normal. <coughs> and with a partial D, there are a less number of, number of epitopes on the red blood cell than normal. So now I've given a little background on blood type, I'm going to talk about the current method of serology. Serology deals with using a syringe to extract blood from the body and then analyzing the antigens on the surface of those red blood cells. However, there is one downfall to serology, as serology can only detect the phenotype of the subject. This can be a problem when it comes to things such as the A1 and A2 subgroups. Within type A, there are many different subgroups, the two main ones being A1 and A2. The people with um, a blood type are mostly type 1A. However, A2 blood type has a phenotype that is between A and O. This means that serological typing may detect an A2 blood group as O instead of A. This may cause an immune response if the person is given a blood transfusion. So now that I've talked about the current method of serology, I'm going to get into the new method of molecular testing. First of all, molecular testing is less invasive than serology as it uses a saline switch to extract cheek cells instead of blood cells from the body. This is important for people with small veins or those who get blood tests on a normal basis, such as those suffering from cancer. Also, a less invasive way in order to determine blood type is important in things such as fetal typing, where extracting blood from a fetus while it is still inside the mother is nearly impossible. Second of all, molecular uh, genotyping can, uh, finds the genotype of the subject instead of the phenotype as serology does. This is important with factors such as the weak D, the partial D, and the A1 and A2 subgroups. Third of all, molecular analysis can find the parental zygosity of a subject, 
which is important in finding the risk factor of diseases such as the hemolytic disease of the newborn. So here's a flow chart of the molecular analysis procedure. I first extracted cheek cells from my subject and purified the DNA by isolating it from the cell debris. I then added two primers that marked the beginning and ends of the ABO gene and multiplied it via PCR or polymerase chain reaction. I then ran a gel electrophoresis to check that PCR had indeed worked and added a restriction enzyme that cut the ABO gene at a target fragment. I then ran a final gel to get my results. So now I've talked about the procedure of the molecular uh, analysis, I'm going to talk about a little background on the ABO gene itself. The ABO gene is on chromosome 9 on exon 6 and 7. The O allele lies on exon 6 and the A and B allele lie on exon 7. To differentiate between the A, um, the a and B allele and the O allele, there is a single nucleotide polymorphism of a deletion at guanine at position 261. This results in a frame shift that renders the O allele non-functioning. In order to differentiate between the A and B allele, there are seven single nucleotide polymorphisms that result in four amino acid changes that are highlighted in red. This red sequence represents the A allele, and the green sequence represents the B allele. In order to differentiate between these two alleles, we use a restriction digestion enzyme that looks for the specific sequence for an allele and cuts it in order to find it in our final gel. So here's one of my final gels from my ABO experiment. Highlighted in yellow are the bands that represent the 164 cleaved O allele. This means that the restriction digestion found the single nucleotide polymorphism and cut it. And it means that this subject has an O allele in their genotype. If you look above here, you can see the 248 uncut A or B allele, which means the restriction digestion enzyme did not find the single nucleotide polymorphism, and thus the person has an A or B allele in their genotype. So now that I've talked about the, um, finding the A and B antigens, I'm going to talk about binding the D antigen. As I mentioned before, the D antigen codes for the Rh factor, which is the plus or minus gene blood type. There are two main genes that code for the Rh factor, Rhd and Rhce. If you are Rh positive, you have both Rhd and Rhce. If you are Rh negative, you only have the Rhce gene. By looking for the presence or absence of the Rhd gene, we can see if someone is Rh positive or Rh negative. So for my experiment, I looked at a 576 base pair segment from intron 4 of the RHD gene and a 198 base pair segment from exon 10 of the RHD gene in order to find the present or absent. As a control factor, I looked at the RHCE gene at a 1,225 um, base pair segment on intron 4. So here is one of my final drills for the RHD experiment. Here you can see the 198 base pair RHD gene which means that the gene was present and thus the person has a protein on the surface of their erythrocyte. This means that the person's um, <coughs> RHC genotype is plus. So here is a chart comparing the serological typing results to my molecular genotyping results. For my test, I found a 100% accuracy match between the molecular genotyping and the serological typing, as well as the second hidden recessive allele that was not found by serological typing. For example, so if we take subject 10, we can see that through serological typing, they are type A. However, through molecular genotyping, we see that they are type AO, which reveals the second recessive O allele that was not seen by the serological test. So in order to confirm my research, I constructed a family tree, because most of my subjects were my family. As you can see here is a basic Punnett square of a mother who is AO, a father who is BO, and the possible option they can have. One key thing to note is if you look at my immediate family, you'll notice that my mother is type A and my father is type O. However, serological tests cannot detect the second hidden recess O allele. So you might assume that the only possible offspring they can have are type A. However, through molecular genotyping, I found the second hidden O allele, and thus I am type O, because I received the hidden recessive O allele that my parents both shared. So in order to confirm my RHD results, I sequenced the gene and found the sequence that represents the RHD gene itself, thus confirming that I was indeed looking for the RHD gene. So in conclusion, I found that molecular genotyping was less invasive than serologi ser serological testing because it uses cheek cells instead of using blood cells. This is important for people who have thin veins or those who suffer from cancer and go through multiple blood tests. Also, it is important for fetus typing as it is nearly impossible to extract blood from the fetus while it is still in the mother. Also, molecular genotyping is more accurate as it 
and we provide the genotype of the subject. This is important for things such as the weak D, the partial D, and the A1 and A2 blood groups. Finally, molecular genotyping can reveal the parental zygosity of the subject. This is important in diseases such as, um, as hemolytic disease of the no newborn, where risk factor must be calculated. Next, molecular genotyping is cost-effective as it reduces unnecessary treatments, such as the hemolytic disease of the newborn, as 40% of pregnant women receive unnecessary treatment for it. Also, molecular genotyping can ultimately save lives as it avoids autoimmunization by finding a more accurate blood type match. So in the future, I propose by using technologies such as the microarray and gene chip, we can improve the automation of the molecular analysis and not only reduce the cost, but also produce samples on a mass level. And also, by using this promising new method, along with serologic typing, we can find a more comprehensive blood type match, which will ultimately um, push the scientific community forward in order for it to, to um, oops, sorry, in order for it to accomplish its goal of personalized pain-free medicine, I'd like to acknowledge Sarah Thaler for her mentorship, Sarah pa Perry for her mentorship in um, lab techniques, Belinda Schmall for her advice on presentations, uh, Dr. Kate Schaefer for her, for her advice on scientific research, uh, Dr. George Fisher for her his advice on developments in medicine, and Dr. Han Lee Han Lee G and the Scientific um, Research Center for his advice on molecular genetic genome. Thank you. Thank you, judges. Yes, sir. What's the cost of executing each molecular genome? The question, what is the cost of executing each molecular genome typing cost? Um, well, well, the machines themselves are pretty expensive, ranging from $1,000 to $300,000 for the PCR machine. But for the actual samples, once you have the technology, it's about $1.36 per uh, single input type polymorphism. Thank you. Thank you. So the question was, how do you collect fetus cells? Um, well, as you might know, the fetus is always um, uh, sloughing off new uh, cells from its skin like everybody else's. So in the mother's placenta, we can extract some fluid from there and, and then extract the cells and the DNA in order to get a molecular analysis of those cells. Yes. I'm interested on how you developed the idea or how, how you got involved in, in this particular process. Well, um, I don't know if anyone knows, but um, the, oh, the question was how I got involved in this research. And um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the TV show House, but on one episode, there was this physician who had an immune reaction to the donated blood because he expressed the wrong type of antigen. And so that kind of got me thinking, um, how can we find a better way in order to find a more accurate blood match? And so that's kind of how, what got me along. And I talked to my mentor about it, and she seemed really interested in the idea too. So I researched and I found these single nucleotide polymorphisms that differentiate the two alleles. So that's how I ultimately found my research. So, how hard do you think it would be to make something like this uh, very small and portable? So the question is, how hard do you think it is to make something like this very small and portable? Well, do um, you mean in like hospital terms? Yeah, in ambulances. In ambulances. Um, well, the lab I used was pretty small, but the machines themselves, it actually takes about five hours to uh, process. Yeah, so, but serological tests actually take two hours to process, so I don't think it would be in something that an ambulance can use, but in terms of hospital terms, um, they can probably use it in one of their labs or research facilities. Yeah. Their genotyping to find the parental zygosity of, say, a child, 
then would it cause issues and say like who is really the father or um, I think that's certainly um, it would be certainly a possibility of um, I don't know discussions and stuff but um, I think ultimately there are tests to find the parental zygosity of say like any DNA type any gene and so um, I guess it kind of relies on the people <laughs> <laughs> So you had to have a lot of, lot of help to do this because there were blood draws involved in those kinds of things. Um, actually, the serological oh, the question was um, that I, did I need a lot of help with the blood draws and other stuff like that? Um, actually, blood draws and the serological tests were not done by me because um, that actually goes against um, occupational safety and health regulations. So um, the tests were performed either at birth. So I found people that actually knew their blood type before my experiment, and then I did the molecular test in order to get my results. Yes, sir. The question was, how many samples did I use? Yeah. Um, for my ABO uh, test, I used 19 samples, and mostly most of them were my family. And for my RH test, I used about 10 samples. Additional questions from the judges? One more question. Okay. Then we'll take one from the audience. Sorry, Thank you. Um, you look like one of the I actually didn't handle that. Much. Oh, the question was that I used ethylene bromide in one of my um, the procedures for my molecular testing. And my answer is that I actually, I did not handle the ethylene bromide because I am underage and I can't handle that stuff. So um, my mentor, Sarah Perry, has a good point. And that's our last question. Thank you very much. Thank you.